success after lockdown stream yard today we got a guest you know that i want i want uh, all my followers family friends to see notice acknowledge his brother formerly incarcerated incredible messenger he's a, a mentor an author a filmmaker and a teaching artist you know his brother name is david hopper i would like uh you know mr hopper if you could just explain to my followers and family and friends you know uh how was it for you growing up in harlem uh as a youth just give me a little bit of background on yourself when growing up as a youth and how that was how that was working out for you man when you was when you was in that stage man that youthful stage my name is d hop they call me d hop for short in my youth in my colorful youth um they call me sky from sky to jordan jordan i always tell people i have three different lives three different um three three different parts of life right i had my youth then i had pre-job core and post-job core because that is where my life really changed that um for the better or for the worse like job core is very pivotal in my life um i grew up in washington heights um from washington heights i lived in all five boroughs though as a youth okay. um, i was homeless as a teen my mom, my family, I'm third of seven. I'm a third born of seven children. Um, I have four brothers, two sisters. Now I, well, I was born with four brothers, two sisters. One of my brothers passed away um, in 2010. He passed away. Um, so yeah, I grew up, like I said, Harlem, Washington Heights, but been around the city damn near it's not a borough I didn't touch living. Um, single parent, my mom's a single parent. I know who my pops was or is, right? But the relationship wasn't there. And just recently, maybe definitely after I came home from prison, after doing a lot of um, soul searching, and, you know, what they call that, retrospect and all that stuff. Yeah. I, I introspection really, yeah i really couldn't um fought him for his ways for you know because come to find out my pops was not quite 30 when they had me like when they conceived me my pops everybody uptown know my pops my pops was um he used to be a, a bank robber his name ring bells in the, in the hood um and he was a, a handsome guy my mom was pretty and they they got you know they was rocking it wasn't yeah. really for marriage looking for children right they just had something going on and i was conceived so looking back in hindsight i'm like shit. when i was 20 25 i'm just trying to get my rocks off right so it just so happened he ain't used protection i got mad and you know i was conceived so for me to look at him as a deadbeat i grew and i matured like he's really not right he's just trying to figure out his life out and um from that Absolutely. point was a real stepping stone for me in maturity and just looking at the world as and from a different aspect so yeah um single parent my mom pretty much raised me i was pretty much raised by three generations of women um my mom's my grandma's and my nana my mom's and my aunt was every day hands-on my aunt my mom's sister and then my grandma's which is their moms and then my great grandmother nana which is you know the matriarch so i came up with respect love i was nurtured you know all the right things it's just i had my own mind i made my own decisions so sometimes people look at us you know um formerly incarcerated system impacted whichever way you you wrote it they look at us like oh because he was raised in a single parent home or because of his 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 upbringing because of his neighborhood like no i i was loved right i just did some bs i did this yeah. I, I just made the choices i made like, made them bad choices that's right yeah, we was those no knuckleheads right it ain't had nothing to do with my moms um so yeah that pretty much um i stopped i was in the street my brother my older brother 
the oldest of all of us. He was pretty known in the in the streets in Harlem too. Um, so it was like me trying to follow him around and do the things that he he was doing. Once I realized what he was doing, and then a lot of the I used to be on the block. I come downtown where he at, and he wasn't there. The older guys, you know, what we call the OGs, they'd be like, "You don't get your little ass out of here." So mm -hmm. it pushed me back up to the hill. And from there, I try to, you know, start doing my own thing. And that just led to everything it led to. Out of town yeah. trips, um, robbery, extortion. And I don't know grand, grand, you know, kingpin status, but enough where in the hood, in the neighborhood, parents knew, like, okay, that little click right there, telling the other kids, stay away from them, right? Because we had a nice little click. So it's like, those little mom, you stay away from them so we had like that type of reputation in the neighborhood but for the most part um i grew up uptown um like i said had good morals instilled in me but i just chose to do the, the things that i wanted to do for the most part absolutely and i think i think that's a lot of our stories are similar you know uh, because Every every time, like I speak to a lot of brothers and sisters, and and I will, I don't care where they at in Detroit, whether they in L.A., they could be in uh, North Carolina. Like the stories are so similar in the upbringings, in the communities that we come from. I, you know, I'm talking blacks, right? Or uh, uh, majority, you know, black people, and that I was the same way. That's the reason why I asked that about your past, like um to share that with me because i noticed that a lot of us we grew up with some values you know what i mean with with, with a good background my mother she was my brother was a drug addict however she still raised us you know what i'm saying and right my grandmother was there all the time it was my grandmother and my mother my father stayed in and out of prison i didn't mm -hmm. have that relationship with him you know that i that i wanted you right. know it was However, I, I learned early that it's, it's definitely not his fault because I looked at his situation. He was, you know, I, I had to, I had to take that, that, uh, that introspection that right, you were just right, talking about right, right, of, right. of myself and say, look, you know what I mean, and, and see his problem. He was on drugs too, heavy in the streets. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean, and um, and and it's just, it's just amazing that. We all have those similar similarities, similar stories. Um, I always ask a person that you have, you know, any positive influences because right. I know this for me in the eighties. I grew up in the eighties, the seventies and eighties, and for me, the positive influence was there. But I always killed that, you know. I, I look at it as as the as you know that positive and that negative, that God and devil on yeah, your shoulders. Yeah, yeah. And, and every time the guard came to take me and tell me this is wrong, I killed it. As soon as it said it, I had so much negativity going on in my life that I killed all the positive things that I was doing, you know, that, that was showing me to get out of this way. And, you know, so I had to learn the hard way with my choices, my decisions. I, um, I had, it's, it's so crazy because I had, um, I would say two mentors, one that was actually a mentor like this is what he did and at the time i didn't even know what a mentor was i didn't know he was mentoring me right it was just an older guy that was cool that liked me he just bring me everywhere like yo come on like he always took me away from the hood like he took me that's the first person that took me bowling and now like to this day i love bowling like that's my go-to activity yeah like he took okay. me bowling i was like 11. like yo come on 12. like come on we're going bowling to take the whole squad like everybody all of the neighborhood kids is like yo come on we're going bowling um and as i grew he just kept with me he he stayed with me like yo come on come on come dj my party he a grown man i'm like 13 14 he had equipment he was a dj he's like yo come on come to the crib on this night we having a party you're going dj i don't know what the hell i'm doing i'm just scratching i'm i'm just playing records he yeah, like yeah, yeah. Keep you going like anything he can do to keep me out of trouble and keep me out of the streets keep me out the streets um goose that's my man Gustav and probably up until okay. I went to prison I was in contact maybe a couple of years before I went to prison 
I was in contact with him. Always good, cheerful, cheerful dude. Always instilling that, you know, the best things to do. Give you the options. Never really told me don't do something. He just gave me options. Like, look, you can do this, right? Like, these are mm -hmm. better steps, right? Yeah. These, there's these an alternative. Yeah. Right. There's right. an alternative you know to what you're doing now. Exactly. Um, so I, oh, I, I had positive influence around me. Um, I had people, you know, dropping them jewels. But like you said too, it was like they dropped the jewels. I kicked them shit. Like I don't want to do that. Like yeah, yeah. I'm going through what I'm doing. You know what I'm saying? Quick. And then um, even in my in my fast life, I had individuals that seen potential. Like son, like this ain't your thing. Like I made it my thing, but like. Yo, little Dave, like this ain't your thing. Like, go up the block, go play ball, right? Where your basketball at? Go draw. I always was an artist. I always creative. I always had that. My mom's when we was young, my mom drew a life size painted, drew and painted a life size Smurf, two Smurfs with the mushroom on the wall. Like, so the creative part of that, the creative, creative um energy and all that. I always had that. I always been around that. Always. My mom was a photographer. Um, I would tell people, my mom was an entrepreneur before motherfuckers even knew what the word meant. Like, I never, mm -hmm. only job I remember my mom's having was at Mar Bell, the, the phone company. She worked there, and only job I know her to have after that was all her own shit. She made dashikis. She had a, a printing company, which I didn't know was a printing company until I got older. Like, she always worked for herself pretty much, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So I always had that hustle instilled in me from back then. But um, it was just to a point where it's like, the creativity was, it was like, not boring, but it came so easy to me, I still look for something else to do. So yeah. that's yeah. really where the transition. And then probably like, all this was happening at the same time, 12, 13, I know we all packed bags, right? We squeegee, pump gas. For me, that was like, all right, I can do that shit. Make twenty dollars, twenty five dollars, whatever. It is. That was good money for a fourteen year old. So I'm doing mm -hmm. that, bringing money home to mom. And she like, yo, what the hell are you doing? She like, oh, stay out the supermarkets. Cause for her, it's just like you doing something else. I'm like, no, this is all I'm doing. You know what I'm saying? At that time, mm -hmm. but yeah. it was just like the creative, the arts just wasn't enough for me. I always wanted something more. I. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to do something other than what I should have been doing. Doing, yeah. That's how that's how it is for a lot of us. If you could talk about um just that first time going through the system, how old was you before oh. you actually received the big bed? Did you ever, you know, go through DFY, Rikers Island as a youth? And you know, how did that how did, what led up to where you, you know, came to the doing crazy this time? Part is, I literally I would, I'm writing a poem now. I'm writing a, a piece called Championship. I'll be 50 in March. So this is the first time I'm saying this in public. Um, I'm doing a piece called Championship for my 50th birthday. Um, so I nice. just wrote a line today, this afternoon, talking about the first time that I was, that I, I came in contact with the system, right? I was 12. We was writing, we was tagging on the train. We went from, nah, we done tagged and got bombed the whole day without getting caught. I'm on my block on 157th and Broadway. I'm getting off the one train. And my dumb ass just, just can't stop. I'm feeling it. I'm antsy. Now, I'm all, I'm always with older guys. It was older guys. So they all get mm -hmm. off the train. We get off the train. My dumb ass stops and try to tag on the train before it goes off, before it pulls off. Police is sitting in the, in the station. They, he, I'm tagging. When I look, he looks. He, they're looking at me. I see them. I just drop the mark. I kick it on the, on the platform. And shit, nigga, just yell. He come. My, the older dudes. If I'm 12, they like 14, 15. They skate. Leave my ass. They hem me up, lock me up, handcuff me. Now, mind you, it's 157th Street. So they take me from 157th Street. They wait for the next train. Take me from 157th Street. They handcuffed me to the train, to the um, to the pole inside. The next train come. They handcuffed mm -hmm. me. They sit me down. They handcuffed me. I'm sitting on the train, handcuffed. 
they take me all the way to two forty second street to the last stop to the little holding cell. From the holding cell, which now once I start thinking about it, they was wrong because whoever it was, the captain, whoever was in charge, they he screams on not in front of me, but you could hear them yelling the shit. So he come back out. They call a car. They took me in the car and bring me all the way back to Humphrey Fishery because that's the transit police central station on 45th on the a train they bring me back to on 45th street in the a train put me in the holding cell and then i got called my aunt my aunt got called my mom's it was crazy my mom whipped me my mom didn't beat me she beat my fingers like she put my fingers on the damn banister it had this thick ass belt she just whipped my fingers just whipped my no my fucking hands were swollen for like two three days so um that was the first time I had handcuffs put on me. I had any kind of dealing with the law. I was 12 years old. Um, mm. Mark, we had to pay a $150 fine, $250, $250, dollars fine or some shit like that. And then I was a senior. So I was in fifth grade going on my senior trip. I was sixth grade going on my senior trip. That shit was a dub. My mom took the trip because she had to pay for the fine. Um, and from that point, from 12, I got arrested again when I was 14 when I moved to Brooklyn. I got arrested twice in Brooklyn. Um, one for extortion. <clears throat> but it was, I, we was extorting the guy, but at 14, what can you really... Yeah, but it, yeah. It was the icy man. So what happened was, when we lived there, we lived in the... Um, this time I was homeless. We lived in the Brooklyn Arms Hotel in Brooklyn. So the icy man used to come every fight between four and six every day. So we used to basically press him, like, yo, you're gonna give us icy, you can't come back around here tomorrow. So every day he came, we take ICs and yeah. one he came, he I guess he was like tired, like, I ain't giving y'all little nigga shit. So then we jumped him. So when the police came, he said, you know, hey, they beat me up every day if we don't give them if, we, if he don't give us icy and money. So they locked us all up and shit. So that um there's like probably like every three two or three years as a teenager i got arrested for something went through the bookings um once i turned 16 because i was still in high school once i turned 16 i went to john f kennedy um at that point is when i started selling weed um it was just like Shit, this shit easy. So it went from just selling weed from being easy. Once I got mm -hmm. back to Brooklyn, I moved back to Brooklyn. I was so naive about crack. Like they gave me a, a 50 pack. He said, Yo, give me $50 back, whatever it was. But I was so like I have no idea of like the breakdown of it. I had to go mm -hmm. back to my man, like, yo, how much we supposed to sell this for? So his brother was always in the streets. His brother was dead. His brother was, was, was everything. Like, whatever, let's, let's do it. Let's do it. I couldn't yeah. go to my brother. My brother would have whipped my ass. So he like, oh, nah, these is $5. You sell them for $5. You get this amount. You give them this. You get this back. So that was my introduction to actually selling hard drugs. Um, And from that, I just realized, like, oh, this shit, I got this shit all the time to get money. And from that, I probably didn't get arrested after that, so I was like, I did a long little stretch of just hustling. I always had some kind of nine to five, some little off the books job. But um, nice. From that, probably my first real arrest after those little stints. My first real arrest, I was twenty nine. I got caught with 11, 11 dimes. I was sick. And 11 dimes was given to me to go drop off to the work. I'm like, why are you taking And this is me really thinking. So he gave me my partner. He said, yo, this the end of the pack. So I opened it up. It was 11 dimes. I'm like, what are you going to do with this? He's like, yo, that's the end of it. Just go give it to him. I'm like, 11, nigga? So he's like, yo, just go give it to him. When we finish, we go, we go re-up. So 
giving him the 11 down before I got there. I stopped, I gave somebody a pound. I'm talking casual talk. And coincidentally, yeah. police was actually surveying the block that I went. I passed that block, but police was surveying that block. I stopped just to talk my shit with my with my guys. Yeah. And they told us, oh, when you gave him the, the five, that was you passed the work off and passing the work. I'm like, that ain't never happened. So I had the work on me. They served me like 10 times before they found mm-hmm. me. So once they found it, they like, oh, nah, you're going down. So that was my first real um, stint. I got yeah, okay. it my, since it really was my my first offense, like my first felony as an adult. Um, okay, one year, um, one year with five years probation. So I did like okay, yeah, yeah, it's got a bullet. Yeah, yeah, two yeah. months out of that. So yeah, because that's that. I, yeah. So that was the first. That was my first felony and my first real time on the island, like really seeing like what it is like i got to the island the island was crazy that was 2000 i want to say it was like 2000 2000 maybe 2000 2001 2000 it was early it might have been 99 but i think it was like 2000 2002 i can't remember but that i was mm-hmm. it ain't scared me straight but i definitely was like oh shit. like yeah this, this is where the big boys play at it yeah and i noticed the i noticed the difference too right with um but the but still the similarities of our lives because we uh, growing up on my block we also had brothers that dudes that wasn't all in and then we had dudes that were all in i'm talking about in the streets you know what i mean so in 84 you know this older guy this older dude that you know grew up with my older brother he knew us as the young dudes on the block. Yo, y'all want to go to D.C.? This is 84, 1984, 85. We like D.C. <laughs> yeah, you make more money out there. He, and he coming back with everything, like new cars, new everything. So I'm like, yeah, I want to go, <laughs> you know. And, and back then, I'm I'm only 14, 15, you know. Uh, uh, I started selling weed on the block at 12 years old. You know, um, then we started going to Wall Street. My, my uh, another older brother that grew up on our block took us down to Wall Street where we the, the five dollar bags of weed we sell those for twenty five dollars, thirty dollars, you know, in a sandwich bag. Put them in a sandwich bag, right. wrap it up right. long, you sell it to the you know, to the people down there on Wall Street for thirty dollars, you know. So, so I seen the progress, I, I had to, you know really look at the progress my first bid was uh uh 30 days for weed you know um, mm-hmm. on wall street and then from 30 days six months five year probation four months on rikers island as a as a youth and then the bullet you know and then the one to three you know now i'm now i'm upstate with one to three but i didn't learn then neither because that was like for me everybody in 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 the prison from me me making that transfer from adolescent to adult was from the bronx or harlem and i knew everybody you know what i'm saying like it was it was it was literally just about like no some nobody i didn't know that was somebody so so you know i was around it all and that and it was just like a badge of honor to do that you know until until i you know started going out of town and then i went out of town up in albany new york and never seen the light of day again after, mm-hmm. you know for two, seven years and six months you know i think it's even 25 years of life you know um um you know so that that i see how when you said like you had a job you had little nine to fives here and you still was doing your thing on the side and i i knew brothers i grew up with other d- brothers that we grew up with that that was like that too made sure that they had a job you know my, my man joe Lionel, all of them they made sure they had jobs if they was doing little stuff on the side too but me i never had that job i never had that that you know they went to the to the uh to the supermarket to pack bags i went to the supermarket right, right. to take the money from the person packing bags <laughs> stuff like that you know what i mean I, the, like i will wait 
when they had the um you know the the summer youth jobs we'll go on Fordham Road Fordham in in, in Jerome and we'll go wait till they cash their check yeah, that's when cash the check. check I know you know and go take and go take their money you know so I, I see the similarities the differences but the similarities as you grow up and yeah. and not so when I when I came home I never I never had a job a day in my life mm. before prior to going to prison I never seen a pay stop I never knew I never knew what a pay stub was none of that so I had to learn all of that while in prison you know what I'm saying I had to bear down and close that gate you know when they called the yard a gym I had to tell myself yo you can't continue down this path man running into this brick wall when all you got to do is walk around it like so I had to learn the hard way I had to learn the hard way but you know I didn't let the time do me I did the time you know definitely that was one of my that's one of my main things I really listen I was really blessed in that fashion too because when I went up <clears throat> I got locked up in Yonkers when I came through um a lot of the guys in the dorms in the house they knew me I had a um, I had a public access TV show I always did camera work I always had the camera like I said I, I was always doing something with the camera photos video I was always doing something um okay. so when I got in when I got into a population in Yonkers, <clears throat> I ain't know everybody, but I knew a good handful of dudes who put me on, like, yo, listen, this is what it is, this is what it is. And I was never like an asshole. I wasn't a super tough guy. I was just me. Like, I never portrayed to be anything else. So a lot of the older guys, they took to that. Like even the younger dude, like, oh nah, son, he, he mad cool, he don't fuck with nobody. And that's really what it was, like. I'm not a sucker, but I'm not a troublemaker neither. So real recognize real anywhere you go. So you no know, dudes understood it like, oh hop, he good. He don't he mind his business. He ain't snitching on nobody, right? He ain't robbing nobody. He ain't fucking with that's he do his own thing. So when I got up, when I got to YO, um, when I was in the, the county, it's pretty much that. You know what I'm saying? Like, yo, son, listen, you gonna go up top, like nigga, you doing some time like we know your case you're doing some time but when you do the time this is what's going to make it better right so i nice. pretty much just listen like every time mm. even if there's some shit that i didn't agree with i listen and i filtered it out if it was for me i'm gonna keep it if it's not for me i'm gonna let it go and um they basically gave me the skills to get through my bid before i got into it like one of them he's like yo Pretty much the way you start your bid is how you're gonna end your bid. It's gonna be hard for you to separate yourself once they know you as this person, right? Like you go up there, you put hands on people, you cut people, you rock. Like it's cool because it's somebody that's gonna be rocking with you, but always gonna see them other guys that's against you, right? So why put the odds against yourself, right? Why stack the odds against yourself if you don't have to, mm. right? So I nice. That's real shit, right? So <clears throat> straight going up, I already knew like I I wanna right get at get, get at dudes and do it this way. But once my I'm in three, four years and I'm like, damn, I want to chill, will I be able to? Right? Let me just chill. Nice. <laughs> so let me let me ask you. So let me ask you, um, was that for that information was received and given to you? before your last bid and yeah. what was what was the last bid how did you you know come into contact with having to do much you know the time you did and how much was it how how how, how long did you do it all so of that. my my the first felony was for you know control substance the 11 dimes and then my next time which was my last time um was uh assault with a deadly weapon um I shot a guy, me and my kids, I went to pick my kids up, short story. I went to pick my kids up from their grandmother's house, driving. I come back to the crib. I lived in the cul-de-sac. So it was like one of them little blocks you gotta go in and come around, there's no exit. Yeah. So to get in the block, it was, to get in the block, it was a lot of traffic. So it's like almost you had to play like Frogger. You remember the game Frogger? It's like you had to like- Absolutely. Dodge in, right? yeah so i dart through i get through the block so it was a bunch of people outside in the street and it was a little street 
So I come through, I blowing it, but I was parking. So, you know, they start yelling, yo, what the fuck? Rah, 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 rah. I got my music. I know they talking shit. Excuse me. I know they talking crazy, but yeah. I didn't know exactly what they were saying. Mm -hmm. So I pull over. So they come to the car. I got my kids in the back. They like, yo, watch where the fuck you going. Rah, rah, rah. I'm like, now nah, I just told you, I've never been the super tough guy, but my anger and ego combined yeah no question <laughs> right so and just to give some backstory my youth from finally 14 up until i got arrested for my sec for my second felony i was known to i was known to always have some type of weapon and let it go right i'm gonna leave it there so no. it was nothing for me to to let the thing go that was second yeah. nature yeah, that was the mentality that's it. right like it was second nature um add my ego right and then my anger issue because now i understand i had an issue right um all combined because i always say a fight happens when two tough guys don't back down right so that's really mm. what happens so they come to the car they talking so I'm like, what? I roll the window down. So he talking, talking. I'm like, yeah, all right. I roll the window up. I let my kids out. I walk to the crib. Now I'm walking off. They still talking. All right. I'm gonna, this is me thinking, though. I'm going to kill one of y'all niggas. Go in the crib, get the hammer. I come back out. My wife, she already know what it is. She's like, at the time, she's like, yo, you stop, stop, stop. So I don't know none of this is happening. I'm telling y'all this now because I was told this would what, what happened. I don't remember none of this. I'm just yeah, you blanked out. I, blanked out. I remember going to get the hammer, all the yelling, the screaming. I don't I don't remember none of this. My ex-wife was like, yo, I never seen your face like that before. I'm telling you, yo, stop, stop. I'm pulling on your daughter crying. Like, I don't remember seeing none of that. So I get to the I look get to the middle of the block, cock the hammer, come down the block. Now they see me, they see the hammer. Um, some of them were Spanish, so they like La Policia, I call police, La Policia. So for me, that shit really irked me because two minutes ago, y'all ready to put hands and feet on me. Like y'all bring yeah. fires, y'all grab pipes, yeah, they was going, they gonna put hands and feet on me. So now yeah. I got the equalizer, it's yo call the police. So with that, it just made me that much more angry. I let off the shot, bam. Everybody start running. And soon I'm soon as I let the shot off, all the adrenaline, all the anger that I had in me was released. And at that moment, I told I always had a nine to five. I always had some kind of little hustle. I'm working in the hospital, getting paid more than I ever been paid, but I'm still selling weed on the side. I was halfway out of the streets. My issue was my anger. That was mm. my thing. So wow. when I let the shot go. I'm like, damn, I played myself. Like dead ass. Like. I shot him. Bam. Right there. She was there. I said, oh, I played myself. I ain't run nothing. I just turned back around and walked down the block and shit. We had a little gate in my backyard shit. I went through the back gate, hopped over the gate, went to my, my cousin lives on the next block. I went to my cousin crib, stashed the gun and shit. I'm like, damn, I played myself. The whole time walking, I'm like, I played myself. I played myself. Mm. Like, I knew at that moment, like, this is going to be the end of me. Like the end of the person I knew it at that time. Maybe like 10 minutes later, I called a cab. My and the crazy shit. My cousin wasn't home. She always home. There's one day her ass not home. So I call a cab from a from a building. I get in the cab. The cab, all the shit was so crazy. Every I think everybody knew what was happening except for me. I get mm -hmm. the cab. The cab driver is in the mirror looking at me. He's sweating this shit. He's nervous. I'm like, what the fuck is wrong with this nigga? Like, this is, I'm thinking, I'm like, fuck. But I'm nervous too, right? Because I just shot a nigga. Yeah, yeah. Like, I'm trying But to you get... like, it can't, he can't be associated with what nah, I'm, right. I'm, you know, to, with I'm my thing. Get, I'm trying to get to the city because I'm in y'all because I'm like, let me take this cab, get to the city, you know? So we come around a little curve. It's police. They got the whole street blocked off. They checking every car. So when he gets to them, he look at me. I look at him. And the police flag him over. He pull over. 
they just snatched me out the car. They had my description, white, you know, black male, short hair, white t-shirt, blue jeans. They opened the car, they see me, they snatched me out, boom, put hands and feet on me. Um, that was when I that was I didn't see the street until seven years later. That's my that's that's what happened. Um okay. but so yeah. so while while incarcerated, you know, um you uh you go up north now. How was that for you? Like, was that a just just um trying to just think about and talk about the trauma part of, on yourself, actually going up north and leaving your children, leaving your kids, leaving your family now. Did you ever have that thought like when you first received that up north number and going, you know, the first prison that you went to? How was that I'm feeling saying, for you? What you was going I'm through? Tell you, I'm gonna tell you this. Talking about numbers, right? So my crime, because it's my second felony, I was facing eight and a third to twenty-five, right? Going to trial. Like that's the my biggest number, eight and a third to twenty-five. Only thing I hear is twenty-five. Before that, when I go to arraignment, they offer me five eight. They, they offer me five five years. But you know, arraignment happens within the first week. So I'm still smelling like I'm telling I'm I, I joke right, but I feel like I'm smelling like pussy and pizza. Like I'm still fresh, like the streets. So mm -hmm. they off me five years. I'm like I can't fathom five years. I'm like that shit sound like forever. I'm like five years, and and that's one of the things with us with our culture. A lot of times we watch so much TV. We watch all these cop shows. We listen to our mans and them. So now we in the mix and we thinking all this. BS that we heard is 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 true. That shit is not true. You're like, oh, don't take your first offer. They come back with something lower. All this stupid. Sh yeah, all this yeah. stuff we don't heard in the streets, and we telling each other like that shit is false. So I tell them, nigga, no, I'm not taking five years. Come back with something different, nigga. My next offer was no offer. We taking this all away. It ain't a third of twenty five. What you want to do, champ? So. When you talk about numbers, that alone blew my mind. So I sat up for like 13 mm. months going back and forth the court. Um, I got I got sentenced to seven. I actually copped out the eight. The lawyer came because it went from the eight and 30, 25. I said, listen, we're going to give you 10 or you fight. So, you know, I went back and forth. I can't do 10. So they came back and said, all right, we give you eight. Do eight and you Gucci. I said, you know what? I can see now I'm settled in. I'm understanding, you know, what, you know, what, what's, yeah, yeah, what I'm the yeah. so I'm like, all right, fuck it. I could do eight. I come home. I'm 40. I can do eight. Cool. When I get to court to take when when I get, because they offered me the eight. So, you know, it's like a month, two months later when you actually go get sentenced and all the shit. So when I go get sentenced, it's a whole nother DA. My lawyer and that DA is, was cool. She come back. She like, yo, I got, I got good news for you. I'm like, what's the good news? She like, I got to take it down a year. You got seven. So I got sentenced to seven. I did six flat out of the seven. So like I said, I'm, I always tell people, I always give God his glory. Always, 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 always. Um. So with Amen. that, going up, first thing I'm always, I always say I was a better father than I was a husband. Right? I was a great father. I was a not so good husband. So my kids has always been um, first, like priority wise. Um, so me getting arrested, me signing up for this bid, cause that's what that's what I did. I signed up for the shit. Um, I realized like, damn, not only I'm gone, right? I am took myself out the world, right? I, how they say, I trick, niggas tricked me out my spot, right? So I tricked yeah. myself out my spot. But now I left my little man here by himself. I got a son and three daughters. I left my little man here by himself. He the youngest. My three daughters, which is fresh teenagers at the time, they just going to high school. So I'm like, yo, I left my kids out here for the wolves. That was my initial. I'm like, yo, I really, I really messed up. up. Yeah. I messed up. Like, who the hell going to raise my little man, right? I got my brother, his uncles, you know, friends, but that's not their responsibility to keep it 100. 
Then I'm like, this nigga's ten times worse as me out here waiting for a chick with, with with daddy issues. So I'm like, I really left my kingdom unmanned, if you will. Mm -hmm. And that was everything. That thought, that one thought, is one right. of the main things that got me through the bed saying like yo i have to do better in the bit in my in my whole bid not one time did i ask for money right because i already knew me asking for money is going to take money and shit of opportunity away from my kids so not in my no i'm not bad mom but my ex-wife wasn't the go out and get it hustle like she wasn't that right she get her nine to five and she rocking out it wasn't like oh, i'm gonna go do some extra this and it wasn't that so any no, money sorry. she had went to the kids so i'm like i can't ask for bread so for me i saved the pink slip fight to like two years ago i sent money home like every other month every time i i gained a hundred dollars two hundred dollars from um from working in prison i was sending it home fifty dollars sixty five dollars like i was i was sending money home right yeah. it wasn't for me selling drugs inside nothing that was me busting my ass in the mess hall being a porter all that bread was coming back to the town giving it to my kids right so that understanding that i didn't just trick myself on my spot but i fucked my kids life up like so much so when i came home i apologized to my kids for like a year two years straight so much so they was like, yo, pops, stop. Like, we got it. We know you sorry. You messed up. It's cool. Like, you home now. Let's just make it right. But yeah, it it, it ripped me apart, um, you know, from my soul. And then yeah. you talk about trauma and incidents in there. Like it was one incident, I was a porter, and the cop was like, yo, he was just a dickhead. He was he was he I can't even say that. He was he was a CEO. Like he did Where what were he, you? Oh, my first spot was Mohawk. I went to four spots. I went to Mohawk. From Mohawk, I went to uh from Mohawk. I got transfer. I put in a transfer, went to Southport. From Southport, I went to Woodburn, three spots. I came home from Woodburn. But I went to, of course, we all went through reception. Um, it's closed now though, but I went through um downstate. Downstate. I went through downstate yeah. and they kept me a downstate on cadre for like three months okay like no but i was saying where were you with the cop situation you were just describing uh woodburn my first stop okay. so my first stop it started i'm like okay i see what this is it's it's not always about physical getting beat up getting cut it's mental you know what i'm saying so he tells me yo clean clean the bathroom so mind you we all got different wings so i cleaned my wing already he said clean the bathroom do the showers i cleaned it bam he come back around i'm hanging out you know i'm just wasting time pretty much he said yo hopper i said yeah he said what you doing i said i'm cleaning i had a little rag in my hand and said you know we try to finesse him he said you know what you got about 10 minutes left that's what he said he said yo you got he said you got um some time left i said nah i'm gonna cool out man it's 10 minutes left man i'm just hang out until it's time to go right so he like what he said nah nah ain't no cool out town matter of fact go clean the baseboards so nigga tell me to go clean the baseboards i'm like yo so how i supposed to clean them right i'm thinking to myself like he wanted me to get on my hands and knees and clean this baseboard me being who i am I'm always you no. Know, I always think I, that's why I really never did manual labor. Like truthfully, I think I'm a little smarter than actually having to do the physical labor. So I'm like, yo, I got you. So me, I go, I get the mop, I get the the mop, throw the rag on it, spray it, and then start cleaning the baseboards right from a stand up position. So when he come back to get me to go to go back to the dorm, he like, what you doing? So I'm cleaning the baseboard. So you can see his face. He was dumb red. Like, fucking nigga, right? So I'm like, 
you're not gonna get me on my hands and knees cleaning no damn baseball. So you know, he he kicked me out. He basically kicked me out of the program too, because it was a special program to get into that space. But he kicked me out of it. But it's shit like that. They try to manipulate you and do little things to fuck with you mentally and really destroy your destroy who you are. Right? It's not always about the gangs and it's you gotta watch police. Cause police are there to really break you down mentally and de- and destroy who you are. You know what I'm saying? And I really believe that still to this day. Absolutely. So where you came home from? I came home from um Woodburn. From Woodburn, what year was that? 2012. I came home June 3rd, 2012. I came home okay, summer okay. jam weekend. I got locked up on Summer Jam Sunday, 2012, 2006. I came home Summer Jam Friday, 2012. So I did exactly six years. Okay, okay. To the day. Um, I guess this is a good opportunity right now for us to get into this next segment that we get into here at Success After Lockdown, what we talk about. Okay, from the beat. So this this is our cell therapy session on success after lockdown stream yard where we talk about and get get into the the mental health part of all of this because um I think it, it plays a key role when when um having that culture shock you know being taken out of one environment put into another environment that you really basically have no clue because it's a lot of you know when we first go up north it's a lot of you know um what you said how people will say yo this it's like this you got to do this and when you go up and now you into in that reality you know there's a lot of things that go on and we could talk about trauma for days and days and days years you know with different um things that we go through as individuals up in prison first i want to just uh announce brother michael marshall you know mohammed he, he's here with us today you know this is brother david hopper you know uh michael marshall he he's uh he did 30 years in uh new york state prison as well me and him met at a young age 1990s early 90s and in, in clinton and we've been together ever since like even with if he's in easton and i'm in green haven we still stayed in touch, you know. We stayed in touch all the way to the last day, mm. you know. That that's not, you know, that's endless, you know. Right. But um, so so if I could um, just get you to just speak real quick before Muhammad actually speaks. Well, Muhammad, you could take, to, you know, talk, to, you know, share with the brother who you are first and foremost. Before yeah, my name on. is uh, they call me Michael. They call me Muhammad in prison. You know my Islamic name. But I was listening to you, right, and um. A lot of things you said, I used to think. Right? I used to have that those ideologies as far as um the purpose of the of, of the correctional officer, right? But once we actually got to know them, they weren't robots after all. They were just human beings with a lesser IQ and intellect, right? And, and, and purpose of what they was told to do, right? Mm-hmm. So once I figured it out. I didn't see them as a really a real challenge, right? I was the I was the ultimate challenge, right? Because I saw the world through a different lens. And for them, it was just a job. Right? I, th- I think e- even for us, you know, because we, we, we argue with the, the lady over the counter. You know, people argue, you know what I mean? So it's it's just a job. And yeah. I think that we looked at it as they were doing a robotic job, right? They was doing a superhuman job and they, and they was after us. Mm. And once I overcame that outlook everything became clear and easier, right? Because at the end of the day, these same officers was allowing us to make our fish dinners on the weekend and profit off of it, right? As long as they had their five set up, right? So I'm just saying that That's with human true. interaction, right? With, with social interaction, we really get to the bottom of whatever it is, right? And I think they saw me for, for the black man I was, and I saw them for the white individual or whatever they was for them because some some of the black individuals and Hispanic individuals was doing the same exact thing. So color didn't really matter, right? Yeah, it was worse than the white ones. Made it all up, right? So for me, you know, 
I used to think that way until I evolved. And once I evolved, like I, like I was just trying to explain, the world became clearer, mm -hmm. right? And I began to move a little different, right? Um, a lot of the challenges that you mentioned, you know, with your kids and everything, me and Eric faced the same challenges. You know, I was with him side by side going to court to fight to get his kid to come up to him, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's very, very, very important. And I'm, and I'm just happy to hear that, you know, you were one of them that made that important in your life. You didn't give up. And um, I think that your kids see that. Well, my dad really cares about me. And that's what I liked about, that's what I like now about the generation now, because you see a lot of black young men working with their kids. And I always salute them when I see them. I was like, thank you, man. Thank you for being who you are. You know, we need that pat on the back sometimes as black men knowing that we going in the right direction. And then I see you, right? I see you as the black man you are, right? Just keep doing what you're doing. Um, we didn't get that back in the days. Nah, 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 nah. A lot of black men wasn't doing it, right? They didn't take that responsibility up. Um, in regards to prison, one acronym stuck with me the most when individuals just say, uh, prison is what it is. And I used to always say, it's what we make it. You know, um, I think prison, me, me and Eric made the best of it. You know, he came home with a master's degree. It's what you make it, right? Um, because it's there for change. Right. If you want change, they have things for you to get into. Right. Mm -hmm. You can come home a carpenter, which a lot of individuals did. You can come home as a welder, which a lot of brothers on Facebook did, making buku dollars. Construction, brothers is in construction. It, it's just so many things that they chose to get into. Yeah. But if your mind is, is 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 not clear, right? If you're focused on everything else, you're not gonna tap into these things that are sitting right in front of you, right? More or less, you're focused on, like you said, the asshole police officer, right? Um, they're human. You know, sometimes they can, we can be assholes, right? Um, I'm pretty sure a lot of people, my friends, call me an asshole all the time, right? <laughs> but the stuff I didn't did, so I never really looked at it like that. You know, I looked at it, I'm, I'm going to tap into whatever they have for me, in which I did, um, and I made the best of it. But from what I'm hearing, you you chose to make a lot of choices, good choices, right? You didn't make a lot. I mean, I'm pretty sure we made a lot of poor choices. But at the end of the day, you made up for those with all of the good choices that you've made, right? And, and not only that, we used our in-house hustle to make sure that, that that money went over the wall, right? We didn't always do it for ourselves. We made sure we stayed stable for ourselves, but we took that opportunity to say, okay, I'm going to do everything I got to do in here as far as the knick-knack hustle and everything and make sure I don't take that over the wall, right? I'm going to get it, all it out here, send all that money out, and when I get out, it's over. Right? Not to cut you off, too. Yeah, brother. Not to cut you off, Lyman, well, but it's it's the dynamic is crazy because I look at the dynamic, the different dynamics, but we still we still on that same path. I, my son, he was four months old when I left him. You know, um, Mohammed, he had his child when he was in there. Mm. You know, when he was in prison, he had his son on a trailer visit. You know, you had your children prior to you coming right to prison you know what i'm saying so and, and and yet we still a lot of us we still stayed on that path of um i guess fatherhood because yeah. you know that's 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 what it is a lot of people is you know a lot of black men they don't we don't want to take on that responsibility so you know um when you when you find when I find brothers like yourself and Muhammad that take on that responsibility of of fatherhood, there ain't no book for this. You can't learn this through no book. You know what I'm saying? This you have to you have to have that innate ability to want to you know help and grow with this child. If you could, Muhammad, just share with the brother about your your child, your son. Oh, um. um. My son's 27 years old now. He's 27 years old. His birthday was in January. Um, earlier this month, rather. He's a police officer right now. You know, he works for one of the task force. He's, right now, he's trying to get into uh, the state troopers. He want to get closer to home. I, I don't think any officer loves the atmosphere of the city, right? And what's going on in the city, the changes and stuff like that's going on in the city. And they feel like they're, they're not doing any good in the mm -hmm. city politics right and and for them it's the same way right um officer recruitment is low right only because 
it's it's a job. It is not a job that pays for the city astronomical funds. No, right? no, no, no. So to, exactly. But someone has to do it. Someone has to protect the people, right? Um, you have grandmothers walking out around outside. You have kids. You know, you have wives, aunts, uh, daughters, and someone has to do the job. And just like teachers, they don't get paid enough when it comes to um protecting our youth and our families and friends. But for him. For me, looking at him as a police officer, it's a great honor that I have a child that that will take the opportunity to do these things. But from from my side, I actually got arrested for um attempted murder on a police officer. That's what I was actually accused of. And 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 actually to come home and to have a a son that's a police officer, right? Um, it's it's a different turn, right? Look at the mirror; it's a different turn. Um. It's kind of an oxymoron, right, to have issue like that, you know, for them to say, wow. Because for our generation, we grew up after police, right? That was the ideology. But again, it's just a job, right? And somebody has to do it. It's all about crime fighting. And um, I had the criminal state of mind. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was, it was always cat and mouse, right? Um, cops and robbers. So once I looked at it like that, again, everything started to evolve and, and to see things clearer, you know, and I didn't really want to give him input on how to be a best cop because I was like, the first thing I you know when I came home, he, he wasn't really engulfed in it like that. Now he is, but I was like, don't shoot anybody. Don't shoot any minorities. And his response was, you want me to come home? Right. Like, I said, do what you got to do. Because I didn't want to give him no negative input that's going to slow his training up. Right. Don't you do it? Because I know that you can run into a few individuals that just not gonna listen. Right. Right? And I'm gonna take my son out of the game. I can't handle that, right? So at the end of the day, you have to be, I, I know that I have to be really, really conscious of the conversations that we have when, when it comes to um combat and crime. You know, because um individuals may not be on the level that we're on right now, right? They're on a total different level right now, right? Um, and that's sad, but I used to be those individuals, not to the extent that they are, but on a level where it's, they have to put the, pull out the blue horn. You know, the building surround them, come out with your hands up. You know, so I understand the level and the mentality that he's dealing with. But um, now seeing that and, and, and hanging out with him and understanding the pressure, I'm just happy that he's surrounded with a some co-workers, right, that's his age, that are really on that crime fighting stuff that's really about protecting themselves, right, yeah. and staying as a unit. And that's what you need to combat this stuff because you don't want an individual out there who's your partner, you know, who drops the ball and gets you hurt, right? Because these individuals are thinking that fighting cops is the game until somebody actually gets hurt in real life, right? Right. So it, it, that's, that's where we're at now with that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely. It's funny that you you you, you um, spoke about um, like how I see the the, the the cop right asshole, but what I was saying, I was trying. The point was that at that moment, that's how mm -hmm. I see him. No but question. As you said you realize, and you in the bed, and you really censor yourself. You're like they just trying to get home, right? But my, Just like us. <laughs> my thing is when you're trying to get home and you add extra to it to make my day worse, that's where the BS come in that, right? And that's in every job, right? Right now, my supervisor exactly. is giving me a headache, right? So <laughs> that's right. it is yeah. what it is. Yeah. But understanding that, and remember, I never said color because yeah. I believe it was a cop up there. I know it. Y'all, y'all know the story, right? The news. The black baby, maybe like now I'm not black. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm Can they, French I'm Canadian. Canadian. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. We, we had them. We had them. Yeah, we yeah. know them. You know what I'm saying? So, yes, and not for enough. To be fair, my first computer when I came home, a CEO actually created for me, and mm. he took it and made a payment plan. He shipped it to my crib and said, "Yo, hop, I know you don't got money." Just send me what you can when you can't send it. A cop, mm -hmm. he sent me a whole freaked out dope computer. Yeah. 
you like, yo, yeah. I know you be talking about movies, you do graphics. I, I want to see you win. Just send me what you can when you can. Nice. You know what I'm saying? So my first Bless computer it. was made from a CEO, right? Mm -hmm. Given to me with the faith that I'm going to give him some money down the line. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, it's good people all around the world, no matter what their quote unquote uniform, their attire is, right? So yes, I salute you for that, for bringing that to light. Mm -hmm. um, no. And to go to, with the, um, like I know you said about the trauma, mental health part. I did because when when I sat down to do the interview, when I when we start um, interacting, you said you want the interview. I said yeah. I do want to tell this part of the story because I think this is important. I think this is the little thing that people miss when they come home. They don't talk about or people that never been in prison understand about Absolutely. trauma, and PTSD. I only did set, not only I did my six years right for real. That's I came a lot. home. I was still washing my drawers when I took a shower. I went in the shower with slippers on, right? And this is for a minute. Shorty was like, "Yo, homie, like you home? Like stop doing that shit." My I had wet drawers on the shower because she like my man, man. Like yo, we got laundry man, right? Like why are you wearing your slippers in the damn shower? I'm like yo. Yeah. I'm busting the shower down three times a day. She like, yo, my man, like now I've become disrespectful because you make it seem like I'm not clean. So mm -hmm. all of these things, right? People on the outside, civilians don't recognize. They don't understand that. Like, and to sit down and try to explain that to them, they're going to look at us looking like you crazy. Like, yo, why would you do that? It's a conditioning. It's something we're conditioned to do because of where we was at. And it's not something that, what they say, 30 days makes a habit. So I've been doing this six years. I'm not just going to come home and stop the first day home. But like it took some time. And mm -hmm. I think um, what people need to know and understand with people that's formerly incarcerated, system impacted, time. Like the same way we did time, we need time to, to become, right, to become who we would like to be because yes in prison i did my you know i did my, my my mental work you know but it's still like you said eb that culture shock of getting pushed out basically because when your release date come you getting out it ain't like yo nah give me a little while let me get my no you gotta go yeah. like they push you, out the door, you gotta go so we need that time as well we need understanding and time, the same way we did the time, we need time to get back and to get on the path to be who we would like to be. And I think that's one of the biggest things as society needs to understand. Like, it's not a quick fix. Like, yo, you came home. Like, damn, like, homeboy, like, lady, you got chill. I need time to assess and regroup and, you know, be uh, <laughs> the girl used to tell me all the time, like, Oh, you you did um you did accumulate. What's the word? You make yourself part of the part part of the fixture, like part of the land. Like, oh, you you gotta make yourself part of the land. I'm like, I need time to do that though. To assimilate? No, no, it's, um, accumulate, like like become yeah. a part of society with the norm. Yes. Yeah, the norm. yeah. Like, I need I need I need, I need a, I need a moment to be to 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 get there. So I just think sometimes they look at us like, okay, you're home, what you gonna do now? That pressure is the pressure that causes recidivism. Because now you got like your kids here. Most of us come home, you got a chick, right? Just society, PO, what you gonna do? What you gonna do? You gotta do it, you gotta do it, you gotta do it, you gotta do it. Especially now with the new peer pressure, which is social media, like that peer pressure is like no other peer pressure. They tell me, oh, you gotta do this, you gotta do this. Everybody on social media talking to the talking to the money. Everybody got some kind of hack. Some that you just come home like we need to be able to breathe and have a space. Acclimate, that's the word. You gotta acclimate yourself. Acclimate yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They like, oh, you gotta acclimate yourself. Like, yo, I need a minute. I, I just think that's one of the things. Um 
society as a whole needs to understand and, and grasp that we need time the same way that we did the time. Oh, absolutely. If you could talk about um just your transition, that, that day, that first day coming home from Woodburn and you know, um your drive and oh. what you know how you got into the things that you're doing now and what you're doing now. Talk about all of that. No, I mean, if you don't mind me asking, Dave, how, how long have you been home? Uh, 11 years and two months. I came on 2012 in June. Welcome home, man. Welcome home. Thank you. Um, I finished parole, no violations. Um, <laughs> parole, they, and this is the thing, another challenge, right? I come home. Um, my first day is funny. Because my first day home, that's 12 years ago. I have a documentary coming out um, probably in the next 60 days, Prison to Prosperity. And that term actually started. My older brother, I was telling you, EB, my older brother came to get me from, from Woodburn. Um, he had my phone. That's the first time that I seen the phones like how they are now. Before I went in, it was like just a little regular phone. So I come home, they got the camera on me. They got the camera phone on me. Like, yo, talk to the people. So I'm like, yo, we're going to document this, baby. It's just me talking my shit. Yo, we're going to prison of prosperity, baby. We ain't stopping. And that two-minute clip, I kept in my heart these this whole 10, 11 years. And I said I was going to do it, and I'm doing it. The documentary will be out shortly. Um, so the documentary, Prison of Prosperity, is uh, four individuals on there. Me, uh, a gentleman, J.L. Smith, which is a, a author, filmmaker. He did 10 years in Connecticut. Um, a gentleman, William Evans from Harlem. He did a little more than a year. He did like 18 months on, on the island. Wrongly, confused, wrongly convicted, but well, not convicted, tried to get, you know, wrongly arrested. He went to trial twice, beat it. Um, I did another gentleman, intelligent Allah. He from uh, he's from Brooklyn, but he moved to Atlanta. He's also an author and a copy editor. He's New York. He's one of New York Times best-selling editor. Um, so mm. I put all four stories together, and it's something that I'm doing where it's not just one part. Like I'm gonna have them continuously because it's too many. Like you said in the beginning, it's too many of us, right? We're gonna right. show the world like. This is what we do. It's not, my story is not special. Just how I'm telling the story may be special because we all are special in our own right. But um, so that transition from that first day, I went to see my, I went to my son's school. From my son's school, I went to see my daughters and I see my PO the next day. And from that PO visit, when he said, yo, I had a whole, I still got it. I should have brought it over here. I got actually one of them right here. Y'all know what this is. Y'all all, all <laughs> have it, right? So you can't see what it say on it. It say top secret, right? It got all kinds of jewels. Can't see it. It got all kinds of jewels and things to do when I come home. Um, And one of them was to get a CDL license because I knew what a felony it was going to be hard to get back into the workplace. So I said, yo, if I get a CDL, I know I pretty much work for myself. They're going to always need drivers. So I tell my PO, first day meeting, I know, listen, I got a plan. This is what it is. I got a 10-year plan. I showed him my whole goals and everything. He looked at me and was like, hmm, okay. But first thing you're going to do is go to this program. I said, yo, <laughs> what? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'm just, I got all my stuff. This is my little my little private room we use that we use for the studio and stuff for the photo and stuff. I, it's yeah. all spread around. I just don't want to get up. But I got yeah. my 10 year gold thing over here, right? Like, and I showed it to him. I'm like, yo, this is what I got. Like I'm yeah. just I got a plan. I wasn't in there bullshitting. Like this is he like yeah. <laughs> okay. so, uh, first thing you're gonna do, you're gonna go to this program, right? Then you gonna he started running that he ran down a whole list. I'm like, oh, I'm sitting here. I'm like, oh shit. Like this part of the story is real. Yeah, like, yeah, 
This part of the story was that's like, yo, he PO'd the asshole down a lot. This part of the story, that was real. So I'm like, oh, all right. So now automatically, I'm I'm like, like audible. Like, what can I do now? Like, what's the next thing to do? And he, he told me, say, yo, as for the license, you're not getting no license. Remember, my story started from me driving. Mm. So yeah. everything happened because of me going into the block, getting out the car. Yeah. So for them, it looked like it was a driving issue. So I couldn't get a license. That's mm. first. He showed it to me on the paper, like, yo, no license. I feel like, yo, that's crazy. So long story short, I do like two years with him. I do my thing. I'm not getting in no trouble. But the third, fourth month in, I saved up like twelve hundred. Um, through my bed, sending money home. I saved. I brought. I came home with twelve hundred. With that twelve hundred, first day I spent about two hundred on my kids. Um, I gave my brother hundred dollars. He actually Western Union it back to me like two weeks later. Like, mm-hmm. I don't want money. um. So maybe nine hundred dollars I had. I'm taking cabs. I'm taking my kid out every weekend. We going to movies. I'm taking my, my my daughter had a daughter, so I got a granddaughter now. So I'm just trying to do the parent thing. So maybe three four months in, I ain't got no money. So the girl I was with, she like, yo, go to welfare. I'm like, I'm never going to welfare. And backstory on welfare, public assistance. I seen them talk to my mom. It's crazy when I was little. I pride in myself when I get old, I'm never doing public assistance. So that when he was talking Evie, I said I always had some kind of little job. That's why. Like oh, I don't do public assistance. They talk to you like you're crazy. Like it's not your money. You're here to help people, but you don't. So um that's how I feel about public assistance still to this day. All right. So <laughs> like, yo, go to public assistance, go to welfare. I'm like, I'm never going. Long story short, she cries, she have a nervous breakdown. This is real talk, right? Oh, um, pressure. pressure. So I said, all right, cool. I go. Go to public assistance. They put me on wet. They give me a metro card, and you got to work for the 250, 221, whatever they give me. I'm like, all right, cool. I do that shit for like a month. So now she's like, yo, what you doing? I said, I want to go to school. She's like, you can't go to school. You can go to school, but it doesn't qualify as a job. You still got to do the program. So you want me to go do an MCA job for two hundred twenty dollars every two weeks? No, it's not MCA. It's the parks. Now she playing semantics. It's the same damn thing. It's city work. <laughs> so me and Shorty, she a young, young. She she was she was young, probably the same age. So me and her, we beef in the office. I'm talking about we beefing because she like you gonna take this. I'm like I'm not taking it. So she going back and forth. I'm yelling. She yelling. So. You know, um, security come in. He like, yo, what's up? She like, nah, we good. Cause she was hood too. She right, she a hood chick. She just got a job, but she like, yo, you gotta do this. I'm like, I'm not doing that. So she like, all right, I got. So what happened was, it got to a point. I said, yo, listen, no disrespect, and I don't know if y'all ever been to these web programs. They got dudes and chick. They got everybody lined up in the hallway. They come to get their metro card and sign off. So it's a line of people at the door. So I'm like, yo, listen, no disrespect. I'm not like these niggas. I'm not like these niggas, right? I don't want your 250. I don't want this shit. Like, I'm trying to do something myself. I got certificates to be counselor. That allowed me to start breaking down my certifications. She said, oh, 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 you think you different? <laughs> I am. This is what I'm telling you. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they do, though. That's what you have to fight. And, People that watch this, yeah. what I'm trying to convey to y'all is that you have to fight for yourself. You have to advocate for yourself That's because right. they will just sit in your ass wherever they're gonna send you, and you become a statistic. So I'm like, yo, she said, all right, I got something for you. So she tried to call my bluff. She called her little home girl, her coworker. She likes Mary, bring that paperwork over here. They still got people going to the school. So Mary must have said, yeah. So she comes, she bring the paperwork. It's a flyer to um August community. EB, you from the Bronx, so you might have heard of them. They on um 160th on uh they right behind um right behind Forest. Okay. It's a, it used to be a school, but now it's a, a um uh organization that deals with people that come home from prison, 
uh, substance substance abuse. They do the case at T training. So right. she's like, yo, you serious? You sign up for this in a week, and I I write you off. I said, all right. So I go right there. Bam. I go there, sign up, take the eight, you know, take the tape test, whatever that shit is, body the test. So they come back, they interview me, they're like, yo, you in, you start in October. That was like August. So I had to go like two months still back to the thing. But from that point, once I got into August, did the case at C, then they did um internships. So you do intern, if you if you do good to internship, they basically walk you into a job. And that's how mm-hmm. that's what happened. I pretty much the internship was crazy because they had us doing everything, right? They have us data entry, but before I got locked up, I was already doing data entry. So for me, I was it was Gucci. Say so like, oh no, this can be challenging. I'm like, it might be. Like, I'm not giving them my, my sauce. So I'm like, it might be a little challenging. Yeah. <laughs> right. So they, I know they, what I'm doing now. <laughs> right. They they give me the um they give me this assignment. I go in there. I, me and my man, he's still my man to this day. My man Eric. He came home the same. We came home like the same month, and we end up in the program together. And they gave him the same work. See, we he worked on. He interned on Monday and Wednesday. I interned on Tuesday and Thursday. So they gave him the work on Monday and Wednesday. So when I started, they said, "Yo, here, do this," because Eric. Eric, he's falling behind. So I'm like, all right. So I go in, I do his work and my work. So now in the organization, they talk about David, 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 David name is buzzing. So after the three months, they bring me to the office. They like, listen, they got a they got a position for you in the office. In the, and they got a position in the office. Um, we could do a quick interview. We all like you here. You know, just go through the formalities or whatever, and um, we get you the job. And from that point, I never looked back. And that was, you know, it wasn't easy because I still had other trials and tribulations. I was still half homeless. Um, I got kicked out. Me and Shorty broke up. We got kicked out. I brought a car. I lived in the car for like a month. The car got took in. Shit. Like it was a it was a lot, right? And all this time I'm still on parole. Then when I moved. Shorty called police. She called a parole officer. Yo, he don't live here no more. He on social media. He going out of town. He smoking weed. Now, I did smoke. I did smoke weed, but only with her. Yeah. Yeah. So she telling police, oh, he smoked weed. He going out of town. I went out of town, but only with her. Right. So everything that we did together, she tell my my PO, I'm doing. So mm-hmm. he bring me in, you know. They throw they bring the cuffs out. So I'm like, yo, listen, man. She winning right now. She got you interrogating me for something I didn't do, right? So I, you know, I go through my whole spill. So he's like, ah, right, you know what? I'm gonna talk to the supervisor. So the supervisor come, she like, what's the problem? So he like, yo, he moved to Brooklyn. He don't um he ain't tell me. So the supervisor was su- she's super smart. She like, why would you lock him up? She like, you're gonna lock him up and he's still gonna be on our caseload. He like, yeah, he's like, send us out to Brooklyn. Just transfer him. <laughs> so I'm like, <laughs> that be, right? Yeah, but we'll see right? <laughs> right? So they transferred me to Brooklyn. I found my parole in Brooklyn. Um, I was doing, yo, it was, it was that type of, you know, um, transition where I had some great spurts, some great moments, some, some hurdles, mm-hmm. you know, I got over, but then was also still, that wall and that barrier of getting to where I wanted to be. And uh, I'm still not where I want to be, but I'm damn sure close. Um, so right now, I, I just dropped my second book. I authored two books. The first book is called Moments, to, um, Moments, Writings, and Thoughts of a Two-Time Felon. That book I actually use as conflict resolution tool. We teach the kids in high school, middle school, um, then I did a short, I did a two minute film, which the story I told you about how I got arrested. Nope. I actually shot, I reenacted that moment. And then um, after the gunshot, of um, uh, a quote, um, an eye for an eye leaves the whole world blind. 
So we use the film and the quote. Mm-hmm. Right. That was from uh, uh, Aurelius, right? Aquilius? I think it was uh, Aquilius, a Roman. No, um, it was a Roman uh... My man, uh, damn. I always say it's, uh, man. Uh, I use that same quote, though. It, it was from a. Uh, I'm so mad. It's, um, I want to say Buddha, but not, it wasn't Buddha. Uh, no. I'm so yeah. mad right now. I know it too. I don't know. I'm yeah, yeah. Right? I so yeah. we use that. We use that, you know, we start conflict resolution. It's five weeks. So we work with the kids with that. Nice. Um then my wife and I, my my my, my new wife, like <laughs> my forever, my forever wife. Um we have an organization called Nana's Living Room, where Nana's mm-hmm. Living Room think about Nana. It's just love, right? Nana gonna love you. She's gonna check you though, right? But she's gonna love you, she's gonna nourish you, she's gonna make sure. You get what you need and when you go there it's a safe space and that's what we we want to build somewhere where the youth can come they feel safe they can be themselves and learn some stuff right so my mm-hmm. wife is a professional photographer i do video and camera work so we teach the kids how to use you know film photography using experiential learning basically we use it as a tool to combat violence and to actually help them shape and tell their own narrative than what nice. people telling them they should be. Nice. Um, well, do you go to schools? What's, you go to any p- the particular schools or schools all over? Schools all over. We go wherever to work at. Um, right now, we're in, we did, we in Ossining, uh last semester. We got Brooklyn. No, no, we got Ossining, two schools in the Bronx, two schools in Harlem. Um, we just renewed for one of the Bronx schools and one of the Harlem schools. Ossining, they said they're gonna get back to us because their um their budget something's going on with that, but they definitely bringing us back. Um, so yeah, we and we teach and this year this year was the first time we taught little kids. So we we got even the first and second graders rocking out with us. You know, and I think for me that's my favorite little group. That's my favorite group. I ain't supposed to say yeah. that. But that's my favorite, yo. The little ones, man. The little ones is, yo. They minds, man. It's like it's so dope, man. Seeing the little little ones. So, yeah, yeah you know. And we're looking to build and expand more. Just get out there and, and do what we can for the community. I used to always like brush people and shrug people off when they say, "Oh, you know, if I could touch one person, you know, I change the world." I'm like, that shit is so bogus. But. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That was the immaturity, right? Yeah. Understanding that that one person can actually have a following of ten, right? right. And that is definitely and that, and out of those ten, it could be a following of thirty, you know? Right, right. So you know, so I'm definitely, I definitely now uh, take on that 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 mantra. If I could, you know, get through the one of the kids, one person, you know, um, I did my job, right? And as of now, yes. we service uh it's we do 15 kids a class we had four classes two semesters 60 200 we somewhere over 200 around 200 kids roughly um not including my nine to five i'm a community activist we just got the bill passed for survivors of violence individuals that survive violence um they get reimbursement like you go to the hospital somebody put hands on you you get robbed um whatever money you lose it's a process but you're supposed to get the money back and to get the money the process that you have to talk to police it's like four or five steps and in them steps a lot of them actually re-traumatize the victim so the bill that we got we move the barriers so they don't have to talk to police they can talk to a community-based organization they can talk to their pcp they can talk to a pastor a messenger exactly and still you know be um be uh, get, still able to get their funds reimbursed versus talking to the police and getting re-traumatized so we just got that bill passed the governor just signed it uh december 20 20th i think so she right. just so we, we fresh okay. off fresh off for that you know what I'm that's what i do like it's not something like i just wake up and like oh i think i'm gonna do this today like this is what i do like if i'm not yeah. editing i'm not shooting something all my films 
Um, yeah. All my projects pretty much showcase some type of positivity. Even the short film we did, we had a film with Omar Gooden um, called All That Glitters. It's a hood film on the surface, but at the end, it shows that all doesn't glitter, right? So anything that I'm a, I'm affiliated with, that anytime project I'm on, is always some type of positive spin on it. Then that's just who I am. Um, I did, I started, well, I didn't start, I helped start a battle league, Showtime battle league with my guy Showtime. And um, I was pretty much the host and I got all of the, um, the venues. He dealt with the talent. I did the hosting in the venues and the face-offs. And the last time I did, we did a face-off. It was my, my, my second transition. I got baptized. I went back to church real heavily, you know, um, and at the face-off, you got to basically antagonize each opponent to make them talk and go crazy on each other. Like, yo, I'm going to kill you in the battle. Like, and I'm sitting there asking the questions and shit. And I th- I'm like, I can't do this shit no more. This is not who I am. Like, mm. I'm promoting, even though it's not physical, real balance, it's some type of negativity. And my, from, from my perspective, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm, okay. yeah, I'm like, no, nah, I can't do this shit no more. And that was the last time I had anything to do with that, you know, the battle. And from that point, I just did a 180, and everything I do now was just, more like if it's not positive i don't want no parts of it no yeah um, i just wanted to touch on one thing you said um it used to be it, it seems is that your battle cry and i like it um when you said that's who i am a lot of individuals take that and stay in that space right i think that's who you've become because you fought to be the individual you are today and your whole story is fight you know your, throughout your whole story I'm, uh, as i'm listening um you've made poor choices but you kept fighting Right, you kept fighting, and you continue to fight today because these are the things that you keep adding to your toolkit, right? And who you are. So the good individual you are today, you've made yourself like that, right? You you didn't wake up and become that. You've worked to become that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and everyone else has to follow that lead, right? And to see that they could, they were this type of person, and they could become like David, right? Because you worked at it. I think that when individuals look at your work ethic, right? And how you've changed your character to become who you are, right? And say, this is not what I'm willing to do anymore. I think we have more individuals like you, like yourself, right? Because you've put the work in. And through that hard work, this is the product right here. You know, everything you're doing is, is, is just perfect. You know, we need more brothers like you in the community doing what you do, but they have to work at it. And you know, like I said, none of us are perfect, but you're striving right and no matter what path you've taken you always end up on that right path because the path was bumpy right the road you took was bumpy but you you in that jeep regular man and you're going over them bumps and you're doing your thing right and and, and that's what highlights my day when i hear stories like that you know of just keep and, and and just the fact yeah, yeah. that just the fact that mom dot take mom you see we you know this is collaboration that we we got to, you know today it was a conversation but I think it I think it will form more than a conversation you know what I mean because we all do the same work you know yes. um the brother he works you know my brother Muhammad he works in Manhattan for Exodus I know you um, oh nice how go I got stories about Exodus too no question you know and 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 I I did too that's where I do my podcast that's where I do success after lockdown we do our podcast oh no that exodus in harlem the harlem i gotta pull up i gotta pull up on y'all yeah. no question you know, no doubt but i'm still on parole day i'm still on parole man i haven't i'm still fresh out the gate man i'm like it's, it's almost three years i'm still on parole yeah, he'll, he'll be, you know, he'll be oh, wow. yeah, i'm still, yeah, I'm still, yeah, I'm still on parole. And, and to, to your Absolutely. thing about um to acclimate right um i think individuals see think that everything like, like how you said shine everything shiny is like gold for them right they don't see the hard work um they didn't see the part when I came home and slept on the floor and all that stuff, right? Mm. Um, but all they see is I rarely post, but like if I'm in the Dominican Republic, you know, I post that, you know. Right. Just came back from Colombia, you know, I posted that. I'm about to take off in, in, for Hawaii next month, you know. Nice. And I might post that. But they don't know that I'm still on parole, right? I'm still doing my thing, but 
as far as individuals who've been here, right? I mean, just give me give me five years, right? I, I don't even have that yet. I don't even have three years in my belt yet. But once that happens, once you give me that time, like you said, time, right? It takes time. But I think that individuals look at that like, oh, no, you all right. Like, no, I'm not all right. Like you said, I'm still, I'm still traumatized a little bit, right? Let me get that time to get it all out. I think once they do that, right, once they do that, I think that now we've actually settled into our own, right, into the driver's seat. Because right now I'm still shifting and in, in, in trying to get comfortable in the seat. Right. right. But I think people take it for granted that we've been gone for so long. I think you can't make 30 years up. And I'm not trying, right? But I'm saying that give me time to do a little something. Like what you see is not the best of what we're doing right now. Right, you know? right. What we see, we just started. We just started this thing, right? Give us some time, right? And then and sky's the limit. We definitely not our last bad choice, you know. So definitely, definitely. You know, with that, we ain't got a lot more time left. But I do want to give you the opportunity, David, to plug. You know what you're doing, how we get in touch with you, how they get in how our, our followers. You know how we stay in touch, and uh, what you what you if anything you got going on coming up, just talk okay, cool. about. It. Uh, first, reach out to me um, to contact me. Everything is David Hopper. Um, Facebook, David. Like I'm real. I guess I'm. I guess I'm old school compared to what they doing now. Because yeah. TikTok, I'm not really on TikTok. I know, like that's the way. Like right now, it's Facebook, Instagram, um, David Hopper. I am David underscore Unstoppable. Um, I do have the website we just put up, I am David Hopper.com. Uh, Nan's Living Room, we on Instagram. Um, I have two books, as I said before. First book, Moments, Writing Thoughts and Letters of a Two Time Felon. Second book, Moments to Motivation, which is a, a book of essays and poetry. I like to say that it's a book of enlightenment through essays and poetry. It's more like a workbook. We have we have things like what what did you do with your life? To actually write your own eulogy, to give people you know make people think about their choices and what they're doing and where they want to be. That's one of the things that an OG asked me one time, and I you know I, I stayed with it, so I want to pay that forward. Um, we have the documentary coming out, Prison of Prosperity, in the spring. We have all that glitters on youtube um that's a private link because it's in the film festival so for people that want to see all that glitters you have to actually contact me i'll send you the link um then we have a man so which is about a businessman who courts a young social media influencer and starts dating her and then once they get into that entanglement he realizes that his life would never be the same. So I tell y'all what it is off camera, you know, that's coming out in the summer. We actually flew to Cali and shot down in Cali over the summer. Um, and then me writing the book again, you know, people pouring to me is, is only right for me to, you know, give it back to the people. So a gentleman gave me uh, three steps to actually self publishing. So I have a five step um ebook for individuals to self-publish within 30 days um like i said everything that i'm saying people can get just contact me facebook david hopper instagram i am david underscore unstoppable outside of that everything is moving man we just <clears throat> we here just to keep going it's really nothing else to do keep just keep going man and i thank y'all really appreciate you for the opportunity and the platform to really share the story. And last story about Exodus, my man, uh, damn, I can't remember his name, but he, um, I went home, I came home, that's the first place I went. And he actually showed me how to create a resume, do attachments to Gmails and all that shit. And um, I took that shit, man, now I'm fucking helping people with resumes, all because Exodus folks showed me this, the way, man. So. Always, always, always respect and big up the Exodus, man. Always. No question. Thank no you, question. man. Appreciate it, brother. Big up the Exodus, no doubt. And um, uh, my my partner, he's also an author too. Um, that you definitely got to meet him. 
Um, like I said, we do our podcast in the city at Exodus. So when we the next time we do come to the city, because we're trying to travel now to different states um nice. with success after lockdown, we also have our docu-series that that we creating right now as well. Um so the next time we definitely gonna stay in touch. I got your information. We got ours, mm-hmm. we definitely stay in touch and see if you could, you know, come down and sell out. Oh, I don't know when this is airing, but February 9th, I'll be at I'll be in Harlem performing. I also do spoken word, like that's my baby. Um, I do spoken word poetry. Uh February 9th, we'll be in Harlem at the Elk um cafe, bar and cafe on Hunt. On 12th and 7th Avenue, all that information on my Instagram and all that too. But um, I love to see y'all come out, pull up, man. And when, yo, man, I, all all I say is <laughs> lights, cameras. Y'all know what come after lights and cameras? <laughs> Action. It's always a movie when I perform, man. And that's um that's one thing I don't really go around like I don't do the bragging thing. But that poetry, that spoken word, that's my I live there, man. Like it's always. A movie when I get on that stage, man. I love doing you this. Know, a, I know, a, I know you know uh the sister that we grew up with, me and my partner Anthony, Kim Goodluck Seabrook. Yeah, oh that's that's my heart right so, there. So, so you know we grew up together. I don't know if you, you I don't know. Oh if you, no, you know now yes, now it's clicking. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. We yes, interviewed yes, her yes. on success after lockdown. You know, it was a long time coming. She ain't speak to my partner and her haven't spoke for years because you know, they had some healing to do from her best friend and my mm. partner that they used to go with each other. But yeah, they we since Actually, we, she the host, she the one who brought me onto that show on, on February 9th. She hosting okay. the show. Okay, yeah, okay. Gonna, it's gonna be it's it's gonna it's, it's gonna be special, man. Anyway, okay. I love watching her, so she, <laughs> I ain't shopping iron. I've yeah, been watching her for so many years, man. It's like, oh, that's what you're doing. All right, well, check this yeah, out. She she definitely a spoken word. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. No question, man. Well, like I said, I appreciate this time. We definitely looking forward. Definitely looking forward to seeing you again. And if we can make it, we're gonna make it. You know, out there. Yeah, you yeah. know, and 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 uh, looking forward to it, man. Definitely. I appreciate y'all, man. I appreciate y'all so much, man. Again. Uh, you too, man. Well, if you got anything, any words you'd like to say before we leave, man? Like no, I'm just saying out. the brother David is definitely an inspiration. Um, it's it's different roads and avenues, right, to get to to where we need to go, right? Everybody can't take the same road, right? So with the path that they do choose, like the brother David chose a path, this path, right, that individuals can highlight for themselves, right? We don't all have to take the same avenue to get to the same place, right? It's different roads that lead to the same place. And um, just keep the focus. You know, his message is definitely highlighted. Keep the focus. Keep fighting. Because it definitely wasn't easy for him, but he kept fighting. Um, he went through trials and tribulations, and he pushed forward. And that's what we need to see more brothers like that and highlight their story. You know, an author, you know, a father, a husband, and just keep doing activists. These are things that we need to see. You know, the younger generation, the older, some of the older generation need to see that it could be done. No you know what I mean? and just a, a seat and, and, just, and just okay get on the wagon get get in the bus right put, put the right. seatbelt on let Dave drive you know yeah. what I'm saying what's wrong with that you know and, and and we will be sending you a copy of this airing here this this recording for yourself and my producer when he get it he he makes a lot of cuts and then it'll come out in the new season we got season three coming out you know, um, so it'll come out sometime after February. Probably. Okay. But but um I'm here for it. I'll be here. That month. But I appreciate it again, man. And with that, man, let's meet each other at that, you know, at that line. You know, peace and blessing. Okay.